January, but by just involuntary, I somehow showed up on the list many years ago and um, have been following along. It's true. I don't know if you put me on there or Ilya put me on there. I'm just like, okay, I'm on the steering committee. Great, cool. Uh, and I'm sort of the, the guy who does the education bent on Mobile Portland stuff. And uh, we've been planning different meetings, trying to figure out what's coming up on our schedule up ahead. And uh, it occurred to me that Sally has been a company I've been sort of a, a fanboy about and hadn't had seen them been on the schedule of folks talking about at Mobile Portland. So I thought this month might be a good month for them to come and talk. One of the things I really like about what Sally's doing is it's a really different take on uh, mobile messaging, especially from my perspective in the education industry, where there's a lot of paranoia, taboo about cell phones and cell phone numbers and students and all that sort of stuff. And Sally really abstracts all that and makes it extremely simple. Uh, and so hopefully we'll talk a little bit, uh -oh, a little bit about that. Uh, also, a disclaimer, this is not my laptop and not my music. This was uh, Jason's <laughs> laptop and music. So with that, I'll go through the rest of the agenda of opening slides. Uh, so our agenda today would be a little bit of brief networking, announcements, things like that, um, other events, related things. We'll have a presentation from uh, Derek and Greg from Sally, and then we'll have questions, Q&A, where we get to watch Matt run around the room with a microphone and answer questions. Mobile Portland uh, is all about mobile. How many people here, this is their first Mobile Portland meeting? Okay, good. We always like to take that poll. Uh, it is uh, all about mobile. It's the fourth Monday of each month, uh, sort of following off their Mobile Mondays, but they never replied to the original email saying, hey, why don't we make us the official chapter of Mobile Monday? Uh, so we just created our own group, uh, I guess now six, six years ago, is it? No, I think. Uh, anyway, so there's a Google group you can join, there's a Twitter uh, feed you can follow for announcements and such, and as always, there is <laughs> a Mobile Portland uh, IRC node uh, available Woo! where there's at least one person there, apparently. I have not checked this myself. <laughs> I uh, also want to thank our sponsors, uh, Urban Airship, Rivermark Community Credit Union, and Cloud4 for helping make this happen. Um, and they're the ones who bring our food and beverage, provide the space, uh, and it's really appreciated what they do. So there's a, a couple. Yeah? So, um, Ramsey, I don't know if Ramsey has, wants to talk about. Um, <laughs> By all means. I'm good. Thanks. No, you're good? Okay. Urban <laughs> Airship is awesome. This is our, part of our space. Um, Rivermark is looking for a front end web developer. And I think that most of the mobile Portland was about that, but if you know anyone, um, if you're interested in that. That's a good lead into our next segment. The job openings announcements, as always, is the standard job opening announcement from Urban Airship. They're always hiring. I don't know what for, but that's always the case. Uh, and with that, if you have, uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's a great place to work, <laughs> being their sponsor. Uh, but if you have any job openings, now's the time. Raise your hand, and Matt will run around and give you the mic so you can uh, get that out there for everyone here. I'm Dan Swanson. I'm a recruiter. I work with 24-7. Uh, we're looking for a mobile UX engineer for a contract that's going to start in April. And uh, you can talk to me after the program if you're interested. I'll give you the details. Thanks. Hi, Dan. My name's Dan, too. I'm Dan Seiger. Uh, I work in an agency called The New Group. We're always looking for mobile talent. But uh, as a side project, I have some friends who want to build a mobile app. And so if you're independent or... Um, just interested in that sort of work, uh, please come talk to me after the presentation. I'd love to share some information with you. Uh, hi, my name's John Boone. I'm with ProFocus. We're a technology staffing company located here in Portland. And uh, we are recruiting for iOS developers, including a position in Salem. So if you know anybody that's commuting up from Salem, is an iOS developer. I'd like to meet them. Hi, I'm Russell Okamoto. I'm the CEO of Selly, and we're looking for an incredible sales biz dev person and also a DevOps person. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, with that, let's get on to the presentation. I'm going to introduce here Greg Passmore, who's our CTO of Selly, and he's going to talk about some awesome things and what's happening in the social mobile space. So please give a warm welcome for Greg. Always good when it works. If you don't know, we're a Portland startup located a block down the road here above Barista at uh, 13th and Hoyt. We're a small company, been around for a couple of years. There's seven of us. And Russell, my co founder, and I founded Selly because we wanted to make a change in the world. It's kind of cliche, but that's what we wanted. Uh, we kind of came from a background of working on large enterprise software for Wall Street and thought, you know, let's, let's make a product that regular people use and let's try to create some good. So, did the mic just cut out? Okay. Like, a, like a rapper? <laughs> okay. All right, Snoop, Snoop Lion. Yeah. Okay, so, um, we are a new way to build social networks. Um, we're inspired by some of the trends that are going on right now in social networking. Um, right now, you know, there's a big backlash against surveillance. And a lot of the stuff in the news is really about the NSA and the government snooping on you. But the other side of that is pretty much every service you use is archiving everything you do forever and selling it. And they're making a lot of money off of it. Uh, we, on the other hand, don't do advertising. And we think that, um, you know, as time goes on, that's going to be a more common theme. People are going to have more awareness of what information they're putting out there and are going to be more concerned about it. The thing that's happening is we're all slowly turning into cyborgs. Um, you know, we all have a supercomputer in our pocket. Uh, some of you probably have them on your wrists. Um, and I don't see any here, but people are wearing them on their eyeballs too now with Google Glass. And all of these computers, even the watches, are more powerful than the first computer that I ever had. And I was able to do some pretty cool stuff on that. So um, that's a pretty exciting trend. And, and as everything around you turns into a computer, the amount of computation we can do and the cool stuff we can do with it is growing exponentially. Another cool thing that's happening is technology, as it becomes more mobile, is really becoming more integrated into the physical wor world. Uh, before, you know, you would have your computer at home, it wasn't even connected to the internet and you would maybe work on a little spreadsheet. Uh, then with the internet, people got connected together, but they were still at home. Now when you walk around, your phone or your, you know, your cyborg eyeball or whatever you have can have way more context about the world around you. It can know the humidity, it can know the, your location with respect to your 75,000 closest Facebook friends. And it can, uh, if you're in the Olympic Village, it can tell you if there are any uh, really beautiful other Olympians that ate. Um, but all of this technology can tend to create a sense of isolation in people. There's so much power online, it's kind of hard to get out of bed and stop looking at Reddit every day. And, you know, sometimes you want a sense of real community. So, something that we focus on a lot is taking those real world relationships that you have and the people who actually live around you and that you go to meetings with like this one and creating a lasting community online, a version of that real world relationship that can extend into the digital realm. So to kind of summarize some of the trends there, as, as computers and servers got more powerful, this is a common pattern in industries and in technology, Things get centralized and then decentralized, and centralized again and decentralized. And right now, social networking is, they're friends, you've got a 90,000 person network, and 
If you want to join a Facebook group, everybody can see the latest photos that you've shared about your, you know, your sweet bikini you were wearing in Maui and all of that. So we, we have a different perspective in that we think that decentralized networks are the way to go. And you, know, you can extend that even into technology where um, maybe there aren't servers involved. Maybe you're sharing data between individuals from phone to phone. And that's a technology vision that we have, but right now we're working on the software side of it and letting you decentralize your communication so that you can have a group for your friends, you can have a group for your family, and they don't necessarily have to intersect. So if you look at the different types of organizations and groups that exist in the world, they have varying size and complexity. The simplest being in the bottom left corner here, your friends. You know, there's 10 of you, you kind of get along reasonably, you're willing to share everything with each other, it works out. But as you go uh, up in size or up in complexity, things get a little messy. You know, your whole neighborhood over there in the middle right, or your school, or uh, a, a market. And the existing social networks out there, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google+, they have mechanisms to deal with this, but it starts to get a little messy. So the kind of the, what we call the first generation or first order social networks have their own flavor of this in each network. So Facebook is a good example of the friending model where you form these little, it's pretty dark, huh? Uh, where you form these friend clusters in Facebook, and maybe they're isolated, but pretty often they intersect and your network grows and grows and grows. Google Plus has a, a model that works better for a little bit larger groups where you bucket everybody into circles and it kind of lets you choose who you want to spam. Uh, Twitter, on the other hand, is a really good representation of a hierarchical tree where a um, bunch of people follow you, people follow them, and they can push stuff if they want to. Uh, what we're trying to do is model the more complex organizations that emerge from these type of scenarios. So, as I was saying, we kind of feel like we have a next generation on this, and we're, we're trying to focus on emergent groups. So, uh, an organization like a school district is a, is a mis mishmash of circles and trees, and they form something like a forest where the administrative staff needs closed communication, they need to push stuff down to a cluster of high schools or to an individual school, and then they need to push down information to each student or each class, but you know, they might want to communicate upward as well. And so we see all these different uh, shapes of social networks emerging, and we're trying to create the simplest primitives to let people model these. Derek's going to talk about um, the real-world application of this and what uh, people are doing with mobile social networking and Silly in particular. Hi, uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I do a lot of the uh, forward-facing stuff in the company, like dealing with local schools and businesses and uh, sort of helping people with onboarding, so I have a little different relationship with the product. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and go over some of the use cases, the actual ways people are using Selly and mo as a mobile platform to uh, solve issues. So, um, to start, probably our biggest uh, vertical is the education market. Um, locally, we're working with the University of Portland and the Oregon Department of Education and Portland Public Schools, for example, and then uh, hundreds of schools across the country in addition. Um, one thing about Selling in the education field that uh, is beneficial for that niche is uh, the mobile uh, platform is more engaging than traditional platforms like email or Facebook or Twitter. The reason being is uh, Selly, you can you have any type of phone or uh, smartphone or laptop or email, and you can still engage in the groups. So it's device agnostic, and this in a school setting is very uh, uh, unique because uh, not everybody has to have the same income level or the same uh, piece of hardware. So uh, from one perspective, just having it, any mobile device uh, will work makes it more engaging, especially for students 
uh, for things like classroom discussions, uh, getting help with their homework. It could be a, a something to do with their sports team or their after school group. Um, in a recent study, uh, there's been a few of them, has revealed that the open rate for push notifications and SMS is anywhere between 90 and 98 percent. Uh, for traditional email, it's about 15 to 20 percent. So there's an obvious advantage to uh, engaging with your students or your school through a mobile platform. Um, so on top of that, it, it boosts inclusiveness. Uh, I've been to a lot of ed conferences and gathered feedback from teachers, and what they've found is students, shyer students, are more uh, apt to speak up if, if they can communicate through their mobile device, be it the tablet or their phone. And also, it's a way you can control the discussion. We have um, a moderated mode that allows a, pr a professor or a teacher to engage the class, but kind of cut out the uh, know-it-all from answering all the questions. They, using a moderated mode, they can uh, kind of control the flow of the conversation. So it could be about a film or a book or you know a science project. Uh, and then the third bullet point here is uh, privacy is a obvious big concern in schools, especially. Uh, every school district has its own set of social media policies, um, and so that was one of the first things we noticed when we launched Selly is a lot of schools were sensitive when it comes to privacy concerns and uh, how each tool would work around that. So at Selly, uh, when you create a group, you don't have to share your email or phone number, and that carries over in the school environment really well because a lot of times teachers or want to be able to communicate with parents or students without having to reveal their personal information or opt, let the student opt into their Facebook, for example. Um, and then kind of going up further, we have uh, recently been building what we call Selly Fusion. It's a domain-specific um, way to basically build a network for an entire campus or school district. And uh, the difference between just Selly Lite and Selly Fusion is Selly Fusion uh, allows you to federate your network. So you could have every department in your college could have a CELI group. Every uh, school in your district could have a, a CELI group. And then basically you can have hierarchies, you can have different topologies, basically creating the network however you'd like to have it set up. And this allows for federation and um, a very emergent sort of living network. You can have uh, new groups join and or, or uh, close at any time, and uh, it's very fluid, right? So uh, kind of a loose affili affiliation network. Um, this is good for school life, obviously, because, uh, for example, at the University of Portland, you have lots of different clubs, student activity groups, different departments, you know, everything from the library to the print shop to the sports and athletics. So um, that's for the vertical, the school vertical. It's Selly's gained a lot of traction there because of the... Uh, mobile nature um, in the emergent networks. Uh, moving on to uh, social media and emergency management. Um, we found that there's a, this is a pretty uh, good solution for a lot of volunteer organizations that need to outreach to the community to uh, get gather uh, help for an emergency response. Uh, one example is uh, American Red Cross in the Southern California uses CELI to, for wildfire outreach and uh, speaking with them recently at a conference, one of the things they really like about uh, CELI is the ad hoc groups. You can form a group on the fly with a, just a couple text messages. This is really important in the time of disaster response. If there's a power outage, if the uh, cell signal is jammed with people trying to make calls, the SMS is one of the, uh, because of its packet-based nature, uh, it's a lot easier to get a message through than by making a phone call or jumping on the internet if, you have, if you're having uh, uh, power issues. Uh, same with the Selly polling. It's being used uh, for search and rescue uh, to basically send out a poll, find out who's available to respond to a situation, and then you can take those responses and create a sub-cell uh, for just those volunteers. And uh, in general, uh, with messaging flexibility, uh, you can receive the message through email, SMS, or push notification. This works really well um, when you have a volunteer group in an emergency situation because not everybody is coming in through the same access point. Uh, we saw this with Hurricane Sandy. Uh, families and community, or community organizers were using CELI 
to figure out who needed uh, blankets and shelter, ride shares, food. Um, so that was pretty exciting watching. And this was all grassroots. We just uh, heard about it on Twitter. And, and uh, basically there was a lot of outreach during Sandy, post Sandy, using Selly to, uh, for community engagement. Uh, moving on to Selly and government and business. Um, just to go through one of these at a time briefly, the Radisson uh, uses Selly to, we have a photo sharing feature in our app, and they use it for maintenance for their different hotels to basically take photos of stuff that needs to be repaired or room damage. Likewise, they uh, use it as a feedback channel with their uh, hotel guests. Um, and so there's a kind of workflow there. Uh, the LA Fire Department, I was down in LA a couple months ago and spoke with them briefly. Uh, they, the one thing that they like it for is real-time communication and staff organization um, versus it's the static nature of the email and uh, uh, other messaging forms. Having the mobile messaging uh, be real-time is very beneficial for staff communication and for um, immediate response. Uh, City of Portland, likewise, has been using Selly for uh, gang and violence uh, outreach to, uh, there are foot patrols in neighborhoods that communicate about um, gang activity through Selly to, uh, and then they work with local officials, be it the police department or Multnomah County uh, Family Services to kind of uh, keep an eye on uh, gang activity and who needs help in different neighborhoods. And then lastly, um, one of our early adopters as for a business client was the Linda B. Johnson Expressway. Uh, they use Selly to report traffic conditions and utility and maintenance needs on the uh, expressway. So the business vertical is a little more straightforward, but I think uh, the workflow is really where it comes, uh, works really well with Selly because you, you can use, everybody can be on their own mobile device and you can still communicate and sort of get things done using Selly versus traditional email where as I went over earlier, there's a low open rate, and sometimes it's harder to get a response or a message out. Uh, lastly, Selly for activism, and this is probably the one that uh, is most pertinent to Mobile Portland, um, is uh, we really, what kind of put us on the map for activism was the Occupy movement. Uh, we had over 300 Occupy chapters using Selly to organize protests and uh, volunteer and uh, you know, food and donations for, to the activists. And it really kind of started, spawned in Zuccotti Park, and then a Selly group popped up in Boston and Oakland, and even here in Portland, we had representatives down at the Occupy Portland sort of uh, getting feedback from the uh, activists on what, what they liked about Selly and how we could make it better for social activism. Uh, some of those aspects are the anonymity of it, uh, we value privacy a lot, so you can create your own cell account and remain anonymous. And this is obviously beneficial if you're uh, doing socially progressive movements. Maybe you don't uh, want your name and face to be attached to everything. Uh, the, also, likewise, the decentralized nature of a selling network. You can uh, create it on the fly and it has no local source. It's really up to the, the group leaders, the organizers, they control the network of themselves. Um, the quick onboarding and grouping is a very nice feature. If you want to start a movement right away and you don't uh, have time to set up a Facebook page, you, you can create a cell, a group on the fly in just a few texts, and then you can have, a, you know, in a room like this, you could have everybody join right away. Um, so that's obviously very useful for activism when you need a quick grassroots movement and time is sensitive, right? You need to respond um, as quick as possible. And then lastly, uh, and this is kind of applies to the other verticals I went over, the messaging flexibility. Um, it's just the inclusive nature of the platform being device agnostic. Uh, you have people from different uh, demographics and they, everybody wants to, a piece of the action, so it's very inclusive and we feel like this is how a normal community or a social activist movement would be. It shouldn't be siloed to a specific, uh, you know, you have to have a certain device or a certain software to download. You don't, with Selly, you can just kind of uh, create your group and then get, get to work as soon as possible with little, low friction and onboarding. 
Um, so some of the, just briefly here, I don't want to take too much more time, uh, Bikers Against Child Abuse are on CELI organizing. Uh, basically what happens is if there's a report of child abuse, uh, they will, a uh, group of bikers will sort of sit outside the that house or the apartment of the child that's being abused, and it's kind of a protection until local authorities can work with the situation. That's a very interesting, unique way to use CELI. Um, Occupy, I already mentioned that. We have the PSU Student Union is supporting the teachers uh, right now with um, a possible walkout uh, during a class, so there's, there's talks about a strike that might happen soon at PSU. Um, so they've been using CELI, the student union has, to organize a, a walkout. Uh, and then PowerShift is another uh, social activist group that's uh, using CELI to motivate youth to vote and be more environmentally aware and uh, politically active. So uh, that's a good example of how you can create your own uh, emergent networks to actually be more politi politically involved uh, with local politics. Um, so lastly, if, if you're interested, I welcome you to go ahead and try it out right now. This will kind of showcase the onboarding part, which is probably uh, when I speak to different Selly audiences, this is the most, uh, the favorite part about Selly is the quick onboarding, the ease of just joining and creating a group on the fly. Um, so what you would do then is you would uh, send a, te a regular text message just like to your friend uh, but instead of their contact, you would put our short code number, it's 23559. And then in the body of your text, you put Mobile Portland. And if you send that message to 23559, that's basically how you would opt into the Mobile Portland group. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Greg speak a little bit more about uh, what we're working on next. Thanks, Derek. So we didn't really address this earlier, but we call our group cells, and uh, we we do this for a few reasons. One, we are inspired by biological metaphors, and you can see we're actually unveiling a new logo today, which is that uh, cell-like shape up top. And a cell originally was named that um, because a, a scientist was looking at a cell in a microscope and thought it looked like a room, which is really the type of uh, experience we're trying to create, but virtually. And so we have this mobile Portland cell that we've set up uh, as a way to s stay connected with this group, and we really want to collaborate more with the Portland startup community. Uh, you know, you can use Selly for free and, and check out our services, and we'd like to kind of create, like we showed for University of Portland, we'd like to create one of our uh, Selly Fusion domains for the Portland startup community and try to help each other out. Um, Derek kind of walked you through how people are using Selly and what they're doing with it, and I, I'm going to talk about kind of the, the back of the house uh, technology in play and the challenges we've had and how that might be uh, pertinent to other companies. So as, as he showed uh, and talked about, we have a lot of different platforms. Um, we have a, a web interface that kind of looks like this. This is some of my private stuff going on here. I uh, hope it's kosher. Then we have um, mobile apps for iPhone and Android. We just did a major redesign of both our website and our mobile apps, and we're really happy with them. So that cell that Derek mentioned, Mobile Portland, you can also download these apps. And once you're signed in, you just click the plus button and type in Mobile Portland, and you can join the cell. Um, and we also have uh, SMS, which you know is is probably our most egalitarian access mode. Everybody can text message. So it's a great way to get started with Selly, but as people's usage grows, if they have a smartphone or web, they, they tend to move to that. And we also just launched an API so uh, other services and businesses can integrate with us. So we have these five different platforms, and you know, a lot of a lot of companies and startups today focus on one platform and that that really simplifies your problem and gives you something to focus on, but um, the core value proposition we have is egalitarian access and that it's ubiquitous. Uh, for example, if I said to this whole room, uh, join the mobile Portland cell, just install our Android app, you know, probably 70% of you wouldn't be able to participate. Um, 
Likewise, in a school environment, if you say, hey, everybody with an iPhone, it cuts out a lot of people. So it was really important to us to support multiple platforms and to create a vibe of inclusiveness. So the, our SMS platform, like I said, it's great for onboarding, but some of you might know that SMS is a really challenging market to play in. Um, there are new laws that came into effect, the Telecommunications Protection Act that prevents advertising, solicitation, things like that. And since we're a platform, people could use our service to do those kind of things. Um, so we have to be really careful about that. And as a protective measure for now, for example, we eliminated the ability for people to send out uh, SMS invites. You have to opt in on your own. You have to text to join. Um, that's just protective on our end so that nobody tries to sue us for advertising. Uh, you know, most, most usage of Selly is not advertising, or barely any of it is, but, you, you know, we want to be careful. SMS is also quite expensive. The most popular SMS gateway out there that a lot of SMS-based services is built on is it, called Twilio, and it costs a cent per message. And so, if all of you joined and I wanted to send one message, that's, you know, getting close to a dollar to send that one message. And we have, um, luckily, a relationship with a... SMS provider that's much less expensive, but it's still ultimately an expensive thing to do at the end of the day. So if I were a uh, brand new startup that wasn't trying to be uh, egalitarian, you know, SMS might be something I, I swam past. But for us, it's really critical. Um, we have a website that now, with our new redesign, also works in mobile web. And that's a really challenging thing to do, especially we have, you know, hundreds of screens and there's so many browsers out there. Um, the success that we've had is because we've really leveraged open source libraries. So for our layout, we use this library called Foundation that makes it really easy to do mobile grids and desktop grids and handles a lot of the problems for us. And then we leverage a really cool library called Compass that generates uh, style sheets and lets you kind of include little things that um, have cross-browser support, like if you want to do opacity or corners or shadows, you, you can just do it with one line of code and it takes care of all the browser nonsense for you. So we have a lot of our product to open source. We probably have 200 open source libraries across our platforms that we use. Uh, we also have a, an email platform that's pretty cool. So people can send and receive emails to Selly and communicate with their cells. And email, kind of like web, has a lot of challenges. Uh, for example, in Gmail, if you have a link and you try to make it black, it Gmail makes it blue. But you know you can make it very dark gray, and it's okay with that. And learning all these things is is quite a pain. So we've actually discovered recently some pretty cool libraries from Foundation. That library I mentioned earlier, they have a project called Ink that gives you these responsive email templates that work really well in all browsers. And so we're moving to those. We also use um, Amazon a lot in our service for our back end and on the email side they have a really great email gateway called the Amazon SES and it really helps us with deliverability of emails and preventing them from being marked as spam and all that kind of stuff. So we're really trying to leverage what's out there uh, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then uh, on that side, a lot of people uh, now are using um, libraries that let them build the same app, but for multiple platforms. You, you, know, you just write it once and it magically works everywhere. Uh, we took a really hard look at that and ultimately decided it wasn't for us uh, due to the real-time real nature of our platform and our long-term desire to do a lot of really cool uh, visualization and an animation. And um, So we have native Android and iPhone apps and that's, that's a challenge too because, you know, we going back to our goal of ubiquity, we want everybody on Android to be able to use our platform. And the reality is that that means we have to use Android 2.3.3, which is ancient. And, but you know we would lose 30% of our reach if we dropped that. So it, there's a lot of really sweet stuff in Android 4.3, but uh, we still can't use it. We did decide to go with iOS 7, because everybody upgrades their iPhones, which is really cool. Uh, I think Android users would too if they could, but uh, they don't. And uh, the newest platform that we've added is our, 
And uh, that's, that's really because we've gotten a lot of demand for it. And as Derek showed you, we're involved in different verticals. And we can't build everything everybody wants. You know, we are trying to be a platform that is flexible and powerful. But if you want to make it work with your funky server that you have or some, some boutique server application, um, you know, that's why we have an API. And we've, we've gone both the approach of having a RESTlet API and also webhooks, which um, are pretty cool. And the, the big challenge there is rate limiting. You know, uh, you don't want somebody to just take over your service with their API calls. So next up, we're doing some pretty cool, exciting things. Um, as we kind of showed with that University of Portland example, we are, are taking the idea of cells and making it really easy to build a complex organization out of them. And that comes with a bunch of requirements. You know, who can do that? What's the security around that? Who can add a cell to a network? Who uh, can see the messages? Who can delete stuff? And so we're working on a, um, a solution to that. We're also um, trying to make it easier and more fun to discover cells, especially around you. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. We've, we've really been focused on private communication and um, we're gonna open that up a little bit so that people can have uh, discussion around them and in their community and can discover who else is using Celly. So on, the, on what we're doing for complex networks, there's, as I was alluding to, the composition side of, you know, when you have a really large organization, the hierarchy of who's in what team and the dotted line relationships and the uh, um, management and the visualization of all that gets control. So we're trying to improve that. Um, we also have this notion of a folksonomy. That might be a word that some of you know. It's, it's a word that's dear to us. It, it really describes the grammar and the terms that your organization uses. So, you know, your, your pet names for your projects or the terms that are really important to your organization, we have access to all your messages and it's really easy for us to see what topics arise out of that and let people subscribe to certain topics and ignore other ones and form a, a rich view of what's really going on in an organization. And once you get all of this uh, message flow in a large organization, there's a challenge of actually reading it and viewing it. And so we're working on mechanisms to allow roll-up of all of this into a nice visualization and let you kind of drill down on things and filter. On the kind of fun discovery side, we're um, working on this new project that combines uh, GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi to create a discovery mechanism. So the best example of this would be I would just open my Celly app and I would hit broadcast. You all would open your Celly app and you would hit discover and you would immediately see the cell that I'm broadcasting to you and you can all join right away. And this is to really amplify the magic we have in real world scenarios and in real life groups. And we plan to take some of that technology and open source it so that other people create really creative apps with it. As I mentioned earlier, the, the Internet of Things and, and mobile technology like, like Bluetooth is really taking off. And you have devices like Estimo, which is a Bluetooth beacon. And you could place this in your business and anytime anybody walked in, they could say, oh, is there a cell here? Yep, there's a cell, let me join it. And this thing lasts for two years on a battery and it could just be telling your story for you and onboarding people onto your network. So we're pretty excited about that and we'll uh, keep everybody updated as we make progress with that. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thanks to Jason and Thor for letting us talk here even though very, very, very short notice. But I uh, hope everybody enjoyed it and we'd be happy to take questions or address anything that we left out.
Uh, thank you. Can, can you talk a little bit more about, because uh, I'm really curious to know about what's the, uh, you know, the, the slash dot effect in terms of from Occupy Wall Street or natural disasters, like how bad you have to scale up, scale down capacity or infrastructure for SMS gateways or other things like that? What's the horror stories there? Well, um, Russell and I have a background in scalability and in distributed systems. We worked at Gemstone, which was purchased by VMware, their company on Beaverton. Um, that being said, you don't want to spend a ton of money all the time on stuff you don't need. So, right around when Occupy was blowing up, um, you know, we, we had the minimum set of servers to support what we needed, and we did have some hectic moments there where you know, other users were trying to use the system and, and their messages were in the way. You know, the Occupy message, they send to 3,000 people and the, all of our queues and our network calls are all jammed up. Um, but most of it for us wasn't like adding a bunch more servers to it, it was improving our code and figuring out where bottlenecks were and making stuff asynchronous and, you know, our CPUs weren't burning 100%. It was that there was one thread or two threads that needed to be 100 or something like that. So. Uh, where we're at now, um, we understand our scalability pretty well, um, but you know it's it's that ongoing balance of saving money uh, versus having extra capacity for events like that. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Is there a way to share like rich media on this system? Uh, we we don't do video or anything like that. We Generally, it's shared with links. We have photos, and we have Dropbox integration, Box integration, and Google Drive integration. But we don't um, we don't have anything other than that right now. Uh, is there a way to manage groups within a cell and send messages out to a subset of whoever's in the cell? Yeah, uh, some elements of that are there now, but a lot of improvement and richness is coming there with the fusion stuff we were talking about. Um, navigating from one cell to another and traversing an organization and targeting stuff maybe based on hashtag or some tagging that you've done on your own. That's definitely in our short-term roadmap. Thanks. Hi, I'm Brad Varian's question for you, which is, you've emphasized uh, the possibility for anonymity, but is anonymity required on the Sony platform? Because I could imagine there might be, this is a terrible mic, uh, there might be a, um, a financial or institution that wanted to be using your kind of stuff, but wouldn't be able to if it was anonymous. So is anonymous, anonymity required? Hello? Okay. Uh, we have different ways to handle that. So this mobile Portland cell I created, I set it up in open membership mode. Anybody can join it. There's no rules. Um, we have other op security options. So you can require that people, that you approve every single member that joins based on their username, their full name. You can also require people to put in a bio or a password. But um, a future integration that we're working on is c comes from a lot of our, our customers where they have that exact requirement. They have, like a, in a school setting, here are my student IDs. I want those exact people to be members. And once they're members, I will need to know their student ID once they sign up. And I need to be able to correlate that. And so we're working on, a, right now, a simple token-based system where you, you would have people pre-allocated with some marker that you could know who is who. So we actually have full names and stuff like that. My, my full name is in there. I'm not anonymous. What, what we really mean by the anonymity aspect is that nobody knows my phone number, even if I'm using SMS, nobody knows my email, nobody knows my Facebook. It's shielded in that way, but I can identify using other techniques. Thank you. So, um, because of the immediacy of creating the groups and the spontaneity, do you ever have an issue where two groups arise maybe around a national or a disaster could be where they create groups that compete for the same resources or is there a way around that? Um, like if there's a bunch I, of I mean, I think I get your question. I, I'm pretty sure that's probably happened at some point. I, uh, 
what I mean, the, there's no easy way to merge two cells, but once you're on the Celly platform, you can easily invite other Celly users. So you don't need to know their email or phone number. So if that was the case, you could come together. Um, I'll give you a good example. Um, the Occupy movements, there were, you know, all these little cities, uh, you know, from Salem to Eugene to, you know, really small towns in the middle of nowhere had their own little Occupy cells. And uh, eventually what happened is, I'm uh, not sure if it came down from Zuccotti or a, another chapter, but they all decided to team up and create a sort of mega cell that was affi uh, loosely affiliated all the different chapters. So it was, uh, they, and they did that on their own, uh, just they figured out that, hey, there's all these different Occupy movements on Celly, why don't we pull them all together under a group cell? But the difference there is you, we have a feature called hash linking. You can uh, network a number of different cells together without having to actually opt into each other's cell. So that they use that feature to basically keep every, all the chapters um, on the same page and communicate, but still give each chapter its sort of um, autonomy and uh, a sense of uh, uh, privacy, basically. I hope that answers your question. Just to add to that, sometimes that autonomy and that bifurcation of concerns is important. Like in the, in the Occupy Portland case, there were different people who wanted to be in charge, and that's not our domain. You know, we let them sort that out. So there were competing Occupy Portland cells, and it's up to the people to rally and figure out who they want to participate with and who they want to ally with. And so we kind of leave a lot of that up to the to the members. But we are working on like letting people advertise their cells and organize them so that you might see like, oh, there's already a cell for Portland kayakers. I don't need to make my own. I'll I'll just see if that community is relevant to me. See if it works. Uh, yeah, a lot of cool stuff, but I guess I couldn't understand what's the business model. Well, we have a freemium model, so a lot of what you see is free, but we're we're making money off of large organizations, people with the more complex needs. Like that University of Portland example is kind of a great shining example of an organization with administrative needs. They want to corral things together. They want to have security privileges. They want to export data, import data, connect to their backend systems, stuff like that. So um, the we also have some limits on the free service. Most people don't hit them, but if you're a, a major organization, you're going to hit them. We want we want any enterprise, from a school to a to a Fortune 500 company, to be able to have their own social network. You know that is customized to their needs and maintains their privacy concerns. And um, we're seeing good evidence that people are willing to pay for that. I had to step out. I had to step out for a minute, so someone may have asked this. Has the NSA contacted you yet? Um, I think you know that we're not allowed to answer that. <laughs> okay, no more questions? Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. So the next meeting I think is uh, the 24th of next month. Um, we're going to try really hard to get the invitation out earlier than we did this month. So uh, see you all next month.